All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to HSE Enrichment Session 2 for this open day in 2021. I'm um, Dr. Stephanie Russo. I'm a senior lecturer in the um, Department of Media, Communications, Creative Arts, Languages and Literature. I'm the Discipline Chair of Literature, and today I'm going to be talking to you about Jane Austen's novel, Emma. Um, so hopefully you can see my slide. Um, please let me know if there's any difficulties. Okay. So I want to open by starting um, with Jane Austen herself, because Jane Austen is a figure that we can't get away from when we're thinking about her novels. We have to think about her because she is so important, um, both in literary history and as a kind of popular figure that has almost exceeded her novels in the sort of public imagination. So Jane Austen was born in 1775, died in 1817, and she lived through some of the most tumultuous periods in English and world history. So she lived through the French Revolution, the Napoleonic Wars, the Regency Crisis. She lived in a really dramatic period of English history, a really dramatic political, uh, politically um, dramatic period in English history. And we'll talk about Jane Austen and politics a little bit later, because the prevailing myth is that Jane Austen wasn't engaged with politics and wasn't engaged with these worldwide events in her novels. But of course, we know that's not true. And we'll talk through that a little bit later in relation to Emma. So she's living through this time of immense change and upheaval. And her work carefully reflects upon the many social, cultural and political changes of her time. Yet she's been accused of being apolitical due to her focus on women and the family. So she's been accused of not being interested in politics. But if you think about it, the lives of women, the domestic lives of women, and the domestic arrangements of the family are still intensely political subject. Matter. So we'll think about why that is a little bit later. Okay, so a question that a lot of my students sometimes ask me is what is novel about Jane Austen? Why is she important? What is new about Jane Austen's novels? Okay, why does she stand out in literary history? Well, one of the, the reasons I think that she is so novel is due to this focus in her, in her um, works on the everyday. That's quite new for the novel because the novel at the time was very much engaged in an exploration of what we might call adventures. Okay, the Gothic, this was the age of the Gothic novel. This was the age where strange and unusual things were supposed to happen in novels. So you were supposed to get abducted or you might get... Um, you know, a villain chasing you, or there might be some kind of complicated Gothic plot. And what's really remarkable about Jane Austen is she, she strips that back and she focuses on the everyday domestic circumstances of people's day-to-day -day lives. Now, she's not the only writer that's doing that, but certainly she is focusing on the material circumstances of people's everyday lives in, to a far greater extent than most writers at the time. And another reason that she's so novel and interesting is because she focuses on women's lives and experiences. And what she does is she says that women's lives and experiences are important, are important in and of themselves, but are also important subjects in the novel. She also focuses on how the social world shapes our experiences. So she's very interested in the dynamics of the social world and how it shapes our lives. And really what's quite remarkable is her focus on a flawed heroine. So when people read Emma, they sometimes say, oh, that Emma, I can't stand her. She's so meddlesome. She thinks she knows it all. She's so bossy, et cetera. Um, but that's entirely Jane Austen's point, right? She was focusing on a flawed heroine. She wasn't interested in um, images of perfection. Okay, she's interested in women and characters in general who are flawed. And that's not how the novel was supposed to be at the time, right? If you, there was an expectation that if you were reading a novel, that you would be reading about somebody who was a paragon, right? That you, who was a paragon of virtue and who did everything right. Or you were reading about somebody who was the epitome of bad, right? There was less kind of um, complexity in characters at the time. You, characters weren't sort of considered in the same way as, as they are now in our own novels, right? So if you had, if you're writing a novel, you were supposed to present your main character as a paragon of virtue. And Jane Austen doesn't do that. In fact, she says in one of her letters, pictures of perfection make me sick and wicked. She doesn't want to see a cookie cutter perfect heroine. So when people say to you, but Emma Woodhouse is so unappealing, 
that's exactly Jane Austen's point. She wanted to make flawed heroines. She wanted to have characters who were capable of learning and growing. She did not want a paragon of perfection. She wanted a real person. And of course, what's notable about Jane Austen is her satire in which Jane Austen is the satirist par excellence, I think, in English literature. Everything is held up to, to satire. Everything becomes a target of her really barbed wit, okay? Everything about her world, everything about her characters is held up to scrutiny. And I think actually her wit is probably at its most acute in Emma. So to give you an idea, of what she was doing that was so different to novels of the time. She actually writes a satirical plan of the novel at about the same time as she writes Emma. Emma notoriously is dedicated to the Prince Regent. So the Prince Regent was um, the Prince because the Prince Regent because his father, George III, had descended into madness by this time. And he was a big fan of Jane Austen. And he wrote to her, or he got his librarian to write to her. And the librarian said, okay, you, you, the Prince Regent is a big fan. You should dedicate your next book to her, to him, sorry. And this is, you know, this is some suggestions on what it should be about. Well, Jane Austen didn't really like the Prince Regent. In fact, she hated the Prince Regent. She thought he was a terrible, gluttonous, greedy person. And she wasn't very impressed with the suggestions of the Prince's librarian for what she should write about. And she writes a, a beautiful satire on what the novel on, on um, what perceptions of what the novel should be at the time. So she writes this plan of a novel according to hints from various quarters. And she writes, seen to be set in the country, heroine the daughter of a clergyman, one who after having lived much in the world had retired from it and settled on a curacy with a very small fortune of his own. He, the most excellent man that can be imagined, perfect in character, temper and manners, without the smallest drawback or peculiarity to prevent his being the most delightful companion to his daughter from one year's end to the other. Heroine, a faultless character herself, perfectly good, with much tenderness and sentiment, and not the least wit. From this outset, the story will proceed and contain a striking variety of adventures. Heroine and her father, never above a fortnight in one place, he being driven from his curacy by the vile acts of some totally unprincipled and heartless young man, desperately in love with a heroine, and pursuing her with unrelenting passion. No sooner settled in one country of Europe than they are necessitated to quit it and retire to another. So you can see there in just this little two paragraphs, Jane Austen is really satirising what people think should be the subjects of novels at the time. And you can see there how different she is. You know, this is a, um, a, story, a, a novel about two perfect people who are beset by all of these um, ridiculous variety of adventures and who end up sort of chased being chased around Europe, going from one country to the other. She's not interested in that kind of over-the-top adventure mode of a novel. She's interested in the domestic. She's interested in the real. She's interested in realism as a kind of formal mode of writing. Okay, so you can see there beautifully how satirical she was, how her satirical wit worked, but also how she's writing against this kind of way of imagining what the novel can do. And that's what makes her so important. So I've just got a, a quote here by Sir Walter Scott, who was the, the most famous novelist of the time. And he wrote in a review of Emma about what the novel looks like for Austen. He says, accordingly, a style of novel has arisen within the last 15 years or so, differing from the former in the points upon which the interest hinges, neither alarming our credulity nor amusing our imagination by wild variety of incident or by those pictures of romantic affection and sensibility, which were formerly as certain attributes of fictitious characters as they are of rare occurrences among those who actually live and die. So what Walter Scott is saying there, to put it quite simply, is that Emma is not that kind of novel that Austen was satirising, but she's at the vanguard of this new kind of novel, which doesn't turn on a variety of amusing incidents or adventures, but it turns on the material circumstances of everyday life. So he saw Jane Austen as part of this turn in what the novel could do. And I think that's very important. Okay, let's get to Emma now. So Emma, what's interesting about Emma and what people notice about Emma is the character of Emma herself. Emma is bossy, she is entitled, she's rich, she's snobby, she thinks the world should be organised to her satisfaction. And this makes readers often take against Emma 
But really, I think that's what's so interesting about the novel, because as Lorna J. Clark says in this, in this quote that I've got on the slide, Emma is the complete opposite of the insipid passive, passive maiden featured in so many novels. Okay, heroines weren't supposed to act in the way Emma does in the novel of the time. They were supposed to be passive. They, things were supposed to happen to them. They weren't supposed to make things happen. And the thing that's so interesting about Emma is that she's always making things happen for herself. She doesn't sit back. She's the kind of a character who will go out and meddle and make things happen. So she goes against the grain of um, the kind of heroine that people expected to get in novels of the period. So that's why I think we need to talk, sort of take our initial kind of um, distrust or our, our initial kind of dislike of Emma and think carefully about it and what Austin is doing that is quite different from what she was expected to do. Okay, I want to turn now to the context in which Emma was written. And I think that it's interesting to do this to rebut many of the myths about Jane Austen that we'll get to at the end of this lecture. So let's think more carefully about the context. So despite the belief that Austen is apolitical, Emma explores and demonstrates the plight of the poor during the Industrial Revolution, okay? We know that there are poor people around because Emma and Harriet continually go and visit them. They visit the poor, and this is seen as part of one's social duty to the community. You're supposed to take spare food and go on a visit and distribute it amongst the poor. So we see that this world is heavily stratified by class. There are people who have extreme amounts of money, like Emma's family, and those who have nothing. So the poor are there in the novel. This is not a world of the upper class solely. We also see the interaction of inequality and gender. And I think that that interaction between inequality and gender is really sharp when it comes to Miss Bates. Remember, Miss Bates is a single woman and she's a very poor woman. And the reason that she is very poor is that she has never married, right? So if you think about the, the plight of the single woman in Jane Austen's England, if you don't get married and your father dies, where do you get your money? You might have a bit of inherited money, right, that you live on year to year. Um, and you might live on a little bit of the interest if you've got that in the bank. But there are very few opportunities to earn money. You can't just sort of go out and get a job in the way we would. You could get a job, right, um, as a servant, something as a governess, something like that. And we'll come back to that idea of governess. But there are very few financial opportunities for single women in this world. It's not like you can go to Centrelink, right? So as a single unmarried woman, poor unmarried woman, Miss Bates is incredibly vulnerable. And if you think about it, this is exactly what Jane Austen was as well, because Jane Austen notoriously was unmarried. And she basically lived in a small house on her brother's estate. So she was reliant on her brother's um, generosity to allow her to live in, in a house on his estate. She had, she had income from her writing eventually, but she really had limited opportunity to earn her own money prior to when she became a novelist. So the reason that Emma's slight on Miss Bates when she makes the joke about Miss Bates at Box Hill, which is one of the kind of key moments in the novel and leads to this huge fight between her and Mr Knightley, that's significant because Jane Austen says, actually, Miss Bates is incredibly vulnerable. Right? She is in this, she has nobody to protect her. She has nobody to look out for her. She's only kind of invited to places because people feel sorry for her. She's an incredibly marginalised figure. So Jane Austen really understands the relationship between gender and inequality. And that comes up again, of course, in relation to Jane Fairfax, because Jane Fairfax is to be a governess. Well, that's what everyone thinks she's going to be. They don't know that she's engaged to Frank Churchill. So Jane Fairfax is also in this incredibly vulnerable position. And she makes this statement to um, later on comparing governessing to the slave trade, right? And it's not made much of at the time, but she talks about how being a governess is the, is the sale of the intellect and it's comparable to, a, to the sale of human flesh, okay? So there's a reference to the slave trade in this novel, okay? 
That's important because once again, it is a direct rebuttal to those who would say that Jane Austen is separated from the political circumstances of her time. There's references to slavery in her novels. There's references to slavery in Emma and in Mansfield Park specifically. Now we know that um, the odious Mrs. Weston has come from Bristol. Bristol was one of the um, slave trade hubs in England, right? And we know that she has connections um, to the sucklings through the sucklings to the slave trade. So in this novel, we get oh, the only woman who is associated with the slave trade is presented as odious. So I think that gives you some sort of clue as to what's going on there politically. And we also get this comparison between being a governess and being a slave. Now, that doesn't seem like a very good comparison to us these days, I think, because we know that slavery is quite objectively much worse than being a governess. But I think that what Jane Austen is, is getting at here is that people were being bought and sold in the same way, right? That people were being commodified within the slave trade and also within the governess trade. Remember that governesses were also very vulnerable Okay, governesses were living in a house with a family and were often at the, the mercy of their masters. And that meant that if their master sexually assaulted them, there was not really much they could do about that. And that was very, very common for masters to, um, for the master of the house to sexually assault the governess and the other maids, right? And that actually becomes a plot point in many 18th and 19th century novels, the vulnerability of female servants to their masters. You, there was no police force. You couldn't go and report it to the police. You were incredibly vulnerable as a, as a young woman living in the house of another man. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about um, some other political issues in Emma. Enclosure. Enclosure is a huge political issue in Emma. Okay, so what is enclosure? In the, throughout English history, there were these tracts of common land that were available for all poor people to go and farm and to collect food, to collect fruit, vegetables, to raise their livestock, etc. And what was happening during the Industrial Revolution is that common land was increasingly shut and enclosed, as the name suggests, by private landowners, which deprived rural people of their ability to farm and gather food. Okay. That's important because George Knightley is part of this movement towards enclosing the land. He's interested and involved in agricultural practices, improving agricultural practices, okay? Um, so he's involved in this action that is actually depriving people of the opportunity to earn money from the land. Let's come back to that in a second. Emma is full of references to agriculture and to the landscape. It is a novel that's very interested in the condition of England at the time. There's references to English verdure, for example. Um, there's English weather, the perfection of an English summer, etc. And if you think about the name Donwell Abbey, which is supposedly the paragon of English perfection, Donwell Abbey, Dunwell Abbey, right? This is England done well, okay? This is the, the paragon of Englishness. Um, George is also a very English name. Mr. Knightley's first name is, is notoriously George. And remember, there's this whole discussion about whether Emma can call um, Mr. Knightley George. Um, it's a very English name. It means farmer and was also the name of both the king and the prince region at the time. So England was being ruled by George III. He had gone insane. And as I said before, the prince regent had taken over control of the kingdom on behalf of his um, incapacitated father. So we have a lot of references to Englishness that accrue around Mr. Knightley. His name also, of course, is Knightley. He's like a knight. He's like an English knight. He's an English knight. His name is George, Farmer George, which is what George III was often known as. Um, and he lives in Donwell Abbey, Dunwell Abbey, where the perfection of English um, agriculture is sort of congregated. So his represented as the best of Englishness. However, what's problematic here is, of course, that he's enclosing the land. He is preventing people from being able to access these common areas. And, of course, we have gypsies. Crime is a part of Jane Austen's world. They are these gypsies that live on the fringes of this environment, and they're committing a crime by stealing objects, food usually, um, 
they're committing capital crimes that could result in them being hanged or transported usually to Australia. Now, why are all these gypsies hanging around and why are they so desperate and why are they committing these crimes? Well, they're desperate because they're poor. They're poor because they can't access the common land. Okay, so there's all of this political um, nuance happening beyond, below the surface of Emma. This novel that seems to be about courtship and marriage and so forth, there is all of this real intense social change that's going on just under the surface. And it's bound up with the fact that men like Mr Knightley are enclosing the land. Okay, another really important part of Emma that people have noticed is the, the novel's um, real interest in games and riddles. They're always playing games in Emma. Riddles and puns are actually what the novel turns on. In fact, one um, critic calls Emma one extended piece of wordplay. So the whole novel, throughout the whole novel, the truth is revealed through games and riddles. Games and riddles might seem unimportant or silly, but they're actually deeply revealing. Usually secrets are revealed through games and riddles or things are covered up through games and riddles. Think about how um, Frank Churchill uses games and riddles to kind of cover up his relationship with Jane Fairfax and throw Emma off the scent and direct her attention elsewhere. So what Austin is suggesting is that there's more going on in this society than it appears. People themselves are riddles and what is important is in this society is both what is hidden and what is revealed. There's always more going on under the surface than um, Austin that Austin makes sort of clear, right? This is not just about the world of surfaces. This is what's going on under the surface. So what Austin is suggesting here is that there's the path, the path to self-knowledge is actually through working out of riddles and puns. What the characters are revealing to each other through the use of riddles and puns is what's actually real, right? So she's using this old trope of play and games and riddles and self-deception as revealing the truth. The truth is hard to know, but we need to decode ourselves and others the way the characters in the novel decode the riddles that lead them to what the truth is. So decode what blunder means. Remember, there's a, a, a game that um, Frank Churchill plays where he reveals the word blunder. And um, a lot of the problem with Elton is that his riddle has been misdirected. So instead of the riddle revealing his affection for Emma, it reveals his sorry, instead of his riddle revealing his affection for Harriet, which is what how Emma interprets it, it's actually about Emma herself. So the truth is hard to know, but we need to work to properly decode it. And it's always there hidden under the surface. All right, I wanted to close up today's um, brief lecture by thinking about some, debunking some myths about Jane Austen, as well as um, recommending a really interesting book, Jane Austen, The Secret Radical um, by Helena Kelly, which is a, a, a nice um, book um, to access in order to think about Jane Austen politically in the way I've been suggesting. So the first myth about Jane Austen is that Jane Austen didn't write about politics. Wrong. There's politics everywhere in her books. There's a slave trade, there's enclosures, there's poverty, there's crime. That's just in Emma, right? Um, if you think about Pride and Prejudice, there's heaps of militia hanging out in the town. Why are the militia hanging around? Because they're in the middle of the Napoleonic Wars. Persuasion is all about the Navy and the Napoleonic Wars. Um, so this perception that Jane Austen was isolated from politics, that she only wrote about domestic matters in small villages, is quite wrong. It's just not true on any level because it's all there and you have to kind of not see it. You have to willfully not see it in order to argue that she wasn't connected with the events of her day. And also, the lives of women are political, okay? The ways in which marriage and money work are intensely political. So to suggest that she's not interested in politics is quite wrong on every level. Um, myth two, Jane Austen treated her writing as a private hobby and wasn't interested in publication. Absolutely not. She was very interested in publication. She was very interested in being a professional writer. She aggressively pursued publication. She kept all her reviews. She wasn't... Um, it was an open secret that she was a writer. She didn't put her name on the front cover, um, but everybody knew it was her in her town. So she was a professional writer. She wasn't just some hobbyist. Myth three, Jane Austen lived a sheltered existence. Quite wrong. She had a cousin whose husband was beheaded by the guillotine in the French Revolution. She had brothers who fought um, 
in the Navy, who were members of the Navy. She had a brother who um, had a bank that went bankrupt. She was incredibly well connected to all of the big political events of her time. She didn't live this sort of quiet country existence. She was really well connected to all of the political events of her time. And she was a very um, big reader. She really understood the way her culture worked. And myth four is that Jane Austen only wrote about romance and tea parties. That is not true. There are actually not that many tea parties in Jane Austen. There's, of course, a lot of romance, but there's also a lot of really important social commentary going on. So I think we need to really look at Jane Austen and look at the way we read her and appreciate there's really much more going on in her novels than it might first appear. We have two minutes left, so I'm going to wrap it up there. Does anyone have any questions before we, we go? Okay, thank you so much for coming along to this HSE enrichment session. I hope you found it useful. Um, and remember that we'll be advising online today as well. So I hope to see some of you later. Thank you. Bye.